Here is our scripture text from Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. It says this. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows. Everybody say grows. The whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together. Think stones being chiseled and fitted together, being built together into what? A dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Y'all can be seated. Y'all can be seated. So in just a second, I'm gonna show you a picture and this is a picture of a guy's real-life nightstand taking, taken at a drug bust in Oklahoma a few years ago. So I'm going to ask you to look at, the, at it. Go ahead. And then we're going to see what we see. I'm going to ask you another question. So look at this nightstand carefully. What do you see? In the top right, it's kind of hard to take, make out. It's really impossible, actually. Above the dollar bills... Don't know why you have that stack of, anyways, but um, there is a New Testament and Psalms. It's hard to see, it It got cropped a little bit. Then you also see this Sunstill book from Pastor Stephen Furtick. In the middle bottom, you would see a bulletin and a pen from Life Church in Oklahoma, which is something you only get if you've gone in person. Okay, so you see a Bible, You see a Christian book, you see a bulletin from a church service, and then on the bottom right, things get a little more interesting. There's a bong, and there's a box of, well, for the sake of the littles who might be in the room, let's just call them preventative measures. Um, And it's like, this is a interesting mix of things sitting on top of a table, not at a church service, but at a drug bus, right? So here's my question. What do you think? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it's at least interesting, right? What are you thinking? What are you thinking? Struggling. There's some some struggle happening. Anybody else have some one-word answers? Let's let's get real. Hope. There's some hope. We got the optimist. Someone had her Jesus Wheaties this morning. I like it. So struggle and hope. Let's just leave it at that contrast. I think you're right. I'm intrigued by this picture, to say the least. And what I'm always curious about, and what the thought that's in my head, because I had time to prepare for what I would say as my response, is that I wonder what his story is. I wonder if he grew up in church, but he fell into the wrong crowds and made some decisions that took him down a path that he regrets, and he's struggling his way back. I wonder if he's recently gone through something difficult. Maybe he lost a job or he had a breakup with his girlfriend. Maybe he got depressed and fell into drugs and he was trying to get out. Or maybe this guy struggles with substance abuse. Maybe his dad was an addict and he was around it all the time growing up. But recently someone invited him to church and he went and he was about to become a miracle and make different decisions in his life. I wonder what his story is. You see, it's easy to look at this picture and become critical. But I actually think I might see God working in his life. And I want to tell you something. That we exist for people just like this guy. We exist for the guy with a bong and a Bible on his nightstand. We exist for broken people who are searching and need hope and are struggling and need healing, people who might be one friendship, one lunch invite, one hang away from falling in love with Jesus because they've gotten to know you. And I love this guy. I really do, because I see a struggle going on. That's literally in my notes three times, struggle, struggle. We're on the struggle bus together. I see a guy struggling, and I can relate to what it's like to struggle. And all of us have something you can insert into the metaphorical image of the bong and the Bible occupying the nightstand of our actual behind-closed-doors existence. I love this guy. 
And you may not have a Bible and a bong on your nightstand, but we all got stuff. You got stuff? I got stuff. All God's people got some stuff. I love this guy. Not just because I'm supposed to, but because God is changing things at my heart. And he's taking me on a journey from just being citizens in the kingdom of God together, from just being brothers and sisters in the family of God, to being stones whose lives are stacked upon one another, live at the level of what's on your nightstand? What's your struggle? What's happening behind closed doors? And guess what? I don't just care about that. And I know you don't just care about that. Jesus cares about that a whole, whole lot. In Mark 2, he talked about his motive for why he came to earth in the first place. And he said this. He said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but it's those who are struggling. It's those who are sick. He said, I have not come to call the righteous, but to come to call the sinners. And in this letter that Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus, and especially in these three verses we started last week and we're going to weave some things in and out of, there is a question that can't help but be seen that's just leaping out of the text. And this is the question to you and I as a church together. The question is this, who are we? Not who are you? Like that's a different question for t than today. Who are we? Like us. Who are we? And the answer is, I want you to say this out loud with me, is we are the church. So we, who are we? We are, so let's say again, like who are we? We are Marshall. Um, we are the church. We are the church. With Jesus as our cornerstone, we are being built and formed together into a community of people, unified by our love for Jesus and our love for people that is to be a relational home for the hopeless, for the hurting, and for the people with sketchy nightstands. And one night stands. That just rolled off the top of the tongue. It was right there. Why? Because we are the and when we are healthy, and when we are stones being formed together, we become a home for healing. Why? Because Jesus' own words said, that's why I came. He's our cornerstone. We're the church. What are we a home of? One of the things we're a home of is healing. How does that happen is a big question. And what do we bring to the table in that journey. Well, let me ask you a question today, because it, from the start, let me tell you that God has more for you than the hurt that you have experienced. And he has purpose in and through your pain. And your biggest tests can become your life's testimony. There's purpose in your pain. Your greatest tests can become your testimony, and he has more for you than just coping with and living from and rationalizing and intellectualizing your hurt and your brokenness. He has more. And if there's ever a place on planet Earth that God has uniquely designed for people to bring their brokenness and their hurts, it's the home for healing he is building called We Are The So question, is the person you're becoming, if you look at your life 15, 10, 5, 30 years into the future, is the person you're becoming right now, like honestly right now, more impacted by the hurt that you're carrying or by the healing you're experiencing? And here's another question. Is there room in your life for other hurting people? Because so much about who we are that Jesus is defining for us as the cornerstone who said, I came to be a hospital for the sick, not just some country club for the righteous he so much about who we are together as the is in those questions so let's explore that for a minute and i want to name five types of people that five types of people that contribute 
to how and if and to the dimension, to the degree that we will become a home for healing or not. And they come from a text, a very familiar story, in Mark chapter 2, and I want to read it to you. This is a flannel graph story from your childhood, if you've ever had one, but we're going to look at it from a different perspective. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, it says this. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. And they gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. And some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by the four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof and above Jesus by digging through the roof and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, picture it again. Deprogram your brain from the flannel graph and now like, go on an imaginative exercise with me. Capernaum, just up the hill from the Sea of Galilee. A first century Jewish home is stationed there and Jesus is inside. And it, this home may have looked something like this picture. And the house is full of people. And they're spilling out into the courtyard. And inside the home is Jesus teaching. And suddenly four men with a guy who has a profound need and the faith to go to Jesus, who is curiously seems to be healing a lot of people, shows up at the house. Only problem is, they want to get in the house, but no one will let them in. We are the... Man, there's some things there. Just imagine, people are at the door looking back and making eye contact with the man on the mat. His friends are around him, and then they turn back without budging. In other words, what did the man in need see? Good word, Jesus. And I can only imagine the conversation among the four friends who just got ignored, who just came in faith, and they found resistance and opposition. And they didn't give up. They were full of faith, and so they got creative. They got a little scrappy. They got a little criminal, dare I say. And so they go up onto the roof, which is a pretty substantive sort of structure at this time. And I want you to imagine that you're inside the house, and let's just say you're innocent. You had no idea that someone was at the door and your back was turned, like good people having a moment with Jesus, and they didn't know. It was probably just that one or two, those mean people that are by the door all the time. Like, I don't know. And so you imagine that you hear some footsteps up above the door, up above the roof. Like, what in the world? And then some of the dirt and the clay and the straw that's making up that roof starts to fall. And it starts to dust you a little bit. And it's not just a little bit, it's more and more. First it's a little, then it's a lot. And Jesus himself starts to be like a little like, with, you know, what, what's happening? Then all of a sudden a little bit of sunlight peers through and you're like, oh, those are definitely people. And they're destroying the, the roof. And you're like, is the structural integrity going to hold up? The owner of the house is like, what are you all doing? I brought Jesus to my home and you're destroying it. And once the hole shows up, I imagine there to be like this long pause. And I can picture the scene where the hole gets big enough. And I doubt that the guy got lowered. This is total speculation. This isn't my imagination. I doubt that they just like drop him in. I bet there's that one friend that's like, Hello. we're here. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt your gathering, but we tried the front door. And you all weren't paying attention. Like, the head, just imagine it. I used to think Jesus was going to come back through the hole right there in the middle of that, in that church. Like, where's Jesus? He's up there. When, he's going to come back from the sky. Okay, so right through that hole. Okay. And right about where you all are sitting. Those would have been the glory days. And so, like, but just imagine it. Imagine that head poking through, and all of a sudden, corner by corner, I imagine rope on all four, like, they're lowering this dude in, and he finds himself at the feet of Jesus. 
I wonder what the expression on his face is. I wonder what the expression is on Jesus' face. I wonder what the, the vibe in the room is. Was the air sucked out of the room? Were they scared? Were, were the religious scribes who were pretty angsty about this, what's about to happen, were they like, oh no, like what's happening? But somehow in the face of these friends, in the paralyzed man, Jesus saw the face of faith. And Jesus said to him in response, son, just immediately giving him identity, relationship, son, your sins are forgiven. Now that's a bit interesting, right? Because did the man come to be forgiven of his sins or did the man come to have his legs healed? Yeah, it's a little bit odd. And we don't know what the conversation was like. And I do know that in that time, for someone to have a physical disability was considered that it was a product of their sin. But I have no idea if that's what was happening there. And Jesus makes a huge claim. He's actually making a bit of a shift because he's known as the miracle worker. He's the healer. He's the guy that turned water into wine and he's driven demons out of people and he's doing this stuff. But in this, he makes a huge claim. He says, I'm not just the healer of your bodies. I'm I'm the healer of your soul. Son, your, your sins are forgiven. Well, this offends the religious Jewish scribes that are in the room. And they're like, this is blasphemy. This is punishable by death. And Jesus is like, not deterred at all. And the scene shifts. And he looks at the, the human. He looks at the broken person who's coming in faith because he's connected to people who as a group of five are bringing the one to the healer. And he says, pick up your mat and stand up. Now imagine when he does that. What happens to the people in the room that had just shown their back to the person in need? Does it depart? And they're like, are they, are they tripping? <laughs> like, are they, what in the world just happened? Does he have the authority to forgive his sins? And what was that about? He stood up. And I just imagine the friends like running down from the roof if they weren't already, and they're like chest bumping in the courtyard, like, yes, we did it. We brought our friend to Jesus, and he's like walking out. It's amazing. Can you, like, can you imagine that? Imagine, like, like, maybe there's salty air from the sea that's just down below and the winds and the smell of, like, undeodorized people and animals. And, like, and it's just like a hot incubator of humans listening to Jesus. Like, that's enough. Be like, if we turned the AC off and told y'all and told us ahead of time, I wouldn't want to be here either. But they're, like, pressing to be in the crowded, musty, smelly, Animal smelling, primal smelling home to listen to this guy. And in this story, you see five types of people. Five types of people that are in the room today. Five types of people. I want you to consider who you are and what it means for us to become a home for healing. Which type of people do we want to become? And those here are the five types it's someone in need. Someone who cares, someone who's preoccupied, someone who's full of faith, and someone who's critical. Five possibility. What describes you? First, someone in need. In the room today are needs. There are table side tables with stuff. And in our story was a paralyzed man probably would have been a beggar. And probably to get anywhere, he would have had to sit around and beg people, hey, will you take the four corners of my mat and take me to the place? So I have no idea if these four dudes were friends with him ahead of this moment, or if they were just like, let's take some pity on him. We've heard of this Jesus person. Let's get him there. Like, maybe this will keep him quiet. I don't know what that friendship is like. But I do know they notice someone in need and they put action to the need. And in our lives and in this room, there is and there always be someone in need. And let me tell you, if we are who we say we are, there is no better place to bring your need. No better place. You may be battling depression today, or you're going through a really, really difficult circumstance. 
Or maybe you've experienced a loss, or maybe you feel alone, or you're a single parent trying to figure out how to navigate life in a complicated world. Maybe you're struggling to pay the bills and you're making a decision about who do you rob from and who do you pay just to keep food on the table and maybe hide it from your kids. Maybe you've got anxiety in your life and you don't know what to do with it and it just keeps getting worse. And maybe you're just a guy with a Bible and a bong on the nightstand and you're trying to figure out life. This is a good place for you. We exist for you. My brokenness and your brokenness shows who Jesus is because he is the one that heals our hearts. He mends us together and he takes literally physically broken hearts and he helps guide it together. And he takes the deepest pains of our life and our experiences and somehow he does his thing and he heals. God sees you today and so do we. And can we acknowledge something because there's a temptation in that statement to immediately play the comparison game. Be like, well, my stuff isn't as bad as theirs. Yeah, I'm not gonna get vulnerable to my need. Squash it. Whatever part of being part of a church family has made you feel that and created guilt and whatever else, let me just say, we all got our nightstand. So just bring it to Jesus. And because we exist for you, you can press out of yourself a bit today and you'll find that in our church is also, number two, someone who cares. The reality is I think there's a lot more than just one. And chances are you might be sitting next to or around someone else that you don't even know. And you have no idea how much they might even show you love and care to you if you got to know them. In our story, the paralyzed man was brought to Jesus by friends. Don't know that story. But just to carry a paralyzed man from this stage to that lobby would not be a fun experience. I don't know how far they traveled. I don't know how much money they spent. I don't know if they had to miss work. I don't know what that was like, but I know because they cared, they took, it, they took him to Jesus. And can I tell you a deeper truth that's there? This man wasn't healed simply because they cared. Caring can just be walking past and feeling it in your guts. But empathy and compassion means stopping, conversing, and picking up the corner of the mat to get the person to Jesus. They matched the purpose of their life with the passion in their heart, and they did something for the person in need. A home of healing is full of that. A home for healing is full of that. So there's someone in need, and there's someone who cares. And there's someone who's preoccupied. Say preoccupied. You, you ever show up to some place, like a social setting, you're really jazzed, jazzed? You're really excited, pumped. Um, you're really jazzed to be there. And you show up, and they don't seem as excited to be there as you do. And in fact, most of the time, maybe the worst case scenario, you're like at family dinner, and you're all there, and you're chilling, and you just spend a lot of money for your vacation home, and then all you find is that we're all sitting here like this. I'm like, well, there's been a lot of cheap to sit at my own kitchen table and be preoccupied. Like, you ever experience that feeling? You're excited to be with someone, and they're distracted. They're preoccupied. In our story, the four friends showed up to a house that was full of preoccupied people. Remember this house? Culturally, you'll see in this picture that the door was open. And what that meant in that time was that if the door was open, come on in. Just come on in. And so the door is open, people are coming in, the invitation is being communicated. You're welcome here, you belong here, please come inside. But the impasse for the person in need and the people who cared was a room full of people that were preoccupied not with the need but with something else you may be saying wait are you saying that it's a bad thing to be preoccupied with Jesus like they were listening to a great sermon they were maybe breaking into small groups to have prayer circles they were reconsidering the life and their purpose I'm not going to say bad but I would say there's good there's better, and there's best. And I would say this, there is a trap in the church, in our experience of being a community, of stones being formed together, 
that says something to the lie that is to love Jesus doesn't have to lead to loving people. That's so against not just what Jesus taught, but how he lived. And I would go so far to say the, a little bit more dramatically that if you don't love people, I don't know that love of Jesus is really as deep in your heart as we might think it is. The mission of God is not a separate tangential thing for a few sold out people. The mission of God, which is people, broken people, the bong in the Bible nightstand guy, is directly connected to loving Jesus. And so there is a pathway of you becoming a sold out follower of Jesus that always leads like internally and through your stuff. And you declutter and you reorganize your nightstand of your soul and you get some things healing and on a trajectory. And what is, where does that lead? The purpose is that it leads out to other broken people. And so here's what we've done. We've programmed the mission things and we programmed outreach and we programmed people to a tangential aspect of being a, stone, a, a community for people at the expense of the people. The future of our reaching people, broken people in our community will never be built on the programs that we figure out for you all to participate in. They will be built upon the transformational journey that's happening in your heart that compels you to see people differently in the everyday space that you live, work, play, post, play to go to the ball games, whatever it is. A community of healing happens when God begins to heal our hearts and all of a sudden we can't walk past the beggar anymore. We can't walk past the person in our office who as annoying as they may be is just depressed beyond measure and no one's ever invited them to a work lunch. What God is doing in us is never meant to stay in us. It's meant to get out. The mission of God happens when our hearts fall in love with Jesus first. Because there's a subtle difference between looking at, because I could easily be like, okay, name your person, work on that person, and like, that's fine. But then people are a task. They're not what you're in love with. God wants to rewire what you're in love with so that you can't help but to reframe every interaction of your life for the purpose of relationship and friendship and love of Jesus. Stones being knit together to become a home of healing. What is our posture towards broken people? Is it looking this direction? With the semi-open door, but for security, only one space after 1045, because we live in America. Like, and I'm not saying we should unlock every door and put, you know, like, you know what I mean. What's your posture? Is it this? Like, or is it this? This is a weird setup for a room, by the way. This is weird. I, I don't know that Jesus, I'm, I, I don't know. I wrestle with this. This is weird. I'm going to say it out loud. You can struggle with it. I don't know that church was always just meant to be like seats facing a talker. Let me teach you the ways of Jesus. Go and do. That's part of it. It is part of it. It is in irreducibly part of it. But this is like one sliver of the whole life of being a house, a community that God is joining together in the day in and day out of our own hurts and our baggage and our brokenness and our lives and not just this hour and a half we chunk together in this room to sing songs, send our kids upstairs and listen to a nice teaching that might tickle my emotions and then we'll leave and go get lunch. It is that, but it's way more than that. Way more than that. So there's someone who need, someone who cares, someone who's preoccupied. Then there's someone full of faith. 
Look at verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, everyone say, their faith. He said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. When Jesus saw their faith, that's plural, right? Their faith. Well, whose faith? Their faith. So, I don't know whose faith it was, it was but because it was their faith, it's definitely more than one person. So it's the paralyzed man's faith, it's the friend's faith, it's all of their faith. It's their faith. You catching that? It was the faith of the friends that led to the person in need's healing. Those guys paid attention not just to the need, but to the healer. They believed, they trusted, they took the risk. They were bold enough to say, I can't heal you, but I know who can. And I'm going to press past the preoccupied religious gathering, and I'm going to literally destroy a man's home to get you to Jesus. Their faith was confident. They knew it was Jesus that could heal him. And they risked embarrassment. They risked, like, criminal punishment. They risked it all because they were confident. What gives us confidence? Our own lived experience. I'm not actually confident in who Jesus is just on the things I read and believe. I'm confident in Jesus because I've experienced it. And I know you have too. Their faith was confident. It was compassionate. It was creative. And it was contagious. Look down at verse 11. Jesus said to the man, get up and take your mat and go home. And he got up and he took his mat and he walked out in. I love that mark. I think this is just a clever literary thing. Imagine you walk up to the house and people are preoccupied. I don't imagine every person in that room turning and facing their their back to him. I don't imagine that. Just like now, I can see people walking through the lobby. Y'all have no idea that they're there. I imagine that's the same thing that happened in this room. But Mark goes so far as to say that when he walked out, he walked out in full view, full view of them all. This amazed who? Everyone, and what was their response? They praised God, saying, we have never seen, we have never experienced anything like this. There's a lot there. But I can't get out of the thought of he got up and he took his mat and he walked out in full view of them all. Let me ask you, What would it mean for you to leave your mat here? What would it mean for you to get up and walk and leave behind the mat that you've been stuck to and carried to and hurt by for years and generations and family cycles? What would it mean for you to get up and walk and leave your mat behind? Would it be to lay down your substance addictions or dependencies Because the Spirit is reminding you that you don't need it anymore and there is no substitute for God's Spirit living in you. That it doesn't have to be your crutch and that there is a power greater in your life than the power to help you deal. Would it be to lay down your pornography addiction as the Spirit reminds you that you don't need it anymore? that God can restore your mind and help you walk in sexual wholeness, and that he can remove your shame and he can rewire your desire. Lay it down. Would it be to lay down your need for the way of the valley's obsession with success and the need for more and winning? Because what if the Spirit today could invite you to lay down that mat and pick up something that gets finally down in the depths of your souls that says, I'm a child of God and that's enough for me. That's enough for me. What if your greatest joys and purposes would be connected to not what you strive to to achieve, but what you receive from God himself? What would it be for some of you to let go of the grudge that's not healing you, but it's actually killing you, and it's killing you slowly, it's poisoning you? What would it be to lay down your grudge, and forgiveness is hard, it's so, 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 so hard, but a soul without it will always be drowning in some degree of anger that you can never get rid of for yourself. What would it be to leave behind your shame? Because whatever your story is, God wants to remove and heal your shame. What would it mean to let go of what you need to let go of, and to get up and to walk? And in your walking, you give hope to the broken, 
and you reveal the heart of our Heavenly Father that exists so much bigger and more purposefully and more lovingly than what we can contain in an hour and a half gathering on this day. What would, if, what would it be that if Sunday after Sunday we regather together and there is always space for someone to share a story of breakthrough and laying down a mat and an encounter with the Spirit and things that are being loosed and set free in your life? Even just the simple piece about a question you've been wrestling with your entire life. What would it be? Who are we? We are the church and we are a home of healing. I can picture the piles of mats just being laid out. And picture it. Can you, can you imagine it? Can you imagine it? So we're going to shift. I got a few questions. The first question is, have you figured out which person you are yet? Someone in need. Someone who cares. Someone who's preoccupied. Someone who's full of faith. The reality is there's one more. And this may be our Achilles heel more than anything. Because the fifth person is that someone who's a critic. Listen, I love me the chance to sit around and be critical. I love me some me time just being a judgmental critic. Anybody else love me some me time being a judgmental critic? I know I'm not the only one. I love me diving into some books to just jumble up the simple truth so that I never have to take a bold step out of fear and into love and risk towards people. I love me. Some chilling on the backside of some intellectualism and chilling, leaning back into my critique of everyone and everything. Oh, I'm just smart and analytical. No, I'm fearful. Anyone else? Who? Jesus was met with immediate criticism by the Jewish scribes in the room. But let me ask you a question. Did that stop him? Are you glad it didn't stop him? If, Jewish, if Jesus stopped every time there was criticism or a critical heart towards what he was doing in the lives of broken people, Jesus would never have gotten to the cross. And we're not sitting here. And we have no deeper purpose in our lives. And all we're stuck with the voice of God. All we're stuck with is hopelessness and brokenness that can't go anywhere. Some teachers of the laws were sitting there and they're thinking to themselves, who does this guy think he is? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And maybe you're sitting here thinking like, yeah, I've heard this message before. Have faith. Lay down your mat. Get up and walk. Can I just tell you, maybe God, the first thing God wants to heal you of is a critical heart to believe and to trust and have faith for what God can actually do here and in you and in your family and in our church, but not just in us, through us, because it's meant to get in us, but it's so much more meant to get through us to more people that are sitting around in cubicle and house and fields and bar and wherever else, walking through Kroger right now, that are walking, being carried by the strength stuck on a mat that they can't escape from. And Jesus is saying, I am forming you into a community, a house, a home of healing for these people. Get up and walk. When he walked, they were amazed. But some were critical. Jesus doesn't stop for critics. And I mean this with all the love and humility in my heart, with relationships to be a place of accountability and correction, that we will not stop what God is putting in our hearts because of the criticism of a few. We will go after broken people with our whole life and risking the farm for people because that's what love does. Will we get after it? And let me tell you, the first invitation isn't there for you to go do something. The first invitation is to say, what is my need that Jesus needs to heal me from? What test needs to become your testimony? What criticism needs to become the place of your trust and surrender? What fear needs to become love? What person that I hate needs to be loved?
There are too many people God is asking us to get in the game with and for, to reach and to include in our lives for us to stop short in the name of fear and not love. We are a church all about Jesus as the cornerstone. And he forms in us something that has to change our posture towards broken people. And that happens at the level of who we become, who we love, healing from our own hurts so that we have something to give. Even if it's our own, I have no idea my way out, but I know the one that will get me out. He came for the struggling, not to call the righteous, but to call the sinners. And we will never become a, here's the Jesus juke. We will never become a community, a house of healing by centering on healing and wholeness. No, no, no. We become a a home. Listen, listen. If you hear nothing, hear this. We become a community of healing by centering on Jesus because he's the healer. He's the cornerstone. He holds all the power. And Jesus came for the dude with the bong and the Bible on the night stand. Who are we here for? And so I'm going to invite you to stand. And we're going to, we're going to bring this to the healer of our souls. Give, us me, give me a few more minutes if you can. I want to tell you a story first. We, we, there was a group of guys um, a couple of months ago. We were having a Bible study at the Pallet. So put that in your theological pipe and take a hit for a second. Like, we're having Bible study at the Pallet, and, and yes, there were more than root beers on the table. And people are sharing their lives, and they're sharing their stories, and we're hearing testimonies. Man, Rob, your testimony is so, so, so profound. And... It's towards the end of the night. Evan, you probably remember this night. And there, there's a dude that comes up as we're like shutting the place down because, you know, Bible studies shut down bars. Um, and I'm not joking. Every Monday for months, we're shutting down the bar and then we're standing outside till midnight just talking. And um, a dude came up to me and I recognized him. And it took me a second. And it was a student that I had at TVCS some years ago. And... He, it was his birthday, and so he was partaking quite a bit. But as he's partaking and he's celebrating his birthday, he's listening. And he walks up to us, he walks up to me, and I think Evan was standing there, Chris may have been standing there, I think Joel was there that day. And he's just got tears welling up in his eyes. And he begins to talk about his last few years. And he talks about his health issues a little bit. He's, he's so, so curious. And you can tell he's like, living in that internal high balance acting wire act of like, oh gosh, God is, he's calling me, but I don't know that I'm ready. I don't know that I want to cross that threshold. And he texts to me about his last few years and his life and his regrets and his struggles and his health issues and how all of that in particular created some questions um, about God. And the night ended. And then, I don't think I've ever told you all this, but he reached out to me like a couple weeks later through Facebook. And he goes, Matt, I can't shake, I can't shake what it felt like that night. And he goes, Matt, would God take me back if I asked him? That was his question. Would God take me back if I asked him? And so I'm sitting there on my phone and I'm, Weeping, and probably going to weep again. And all I could type back was, I said his name. I said, Billy, he's never left you. He's never left you. He's not. He's never not been with you. That's my guy. That's. I love Billy. And his nightstand's a wreck. His nightstand's a wreck. And he is still in the early phases of sorting out even how to respond to God. And let me tell you, 
the thing internal to his life that's holding back, him back. It's so much crippling shame about what he's done. And I just imagine, I imagine another Facebook message coming through. I imagine a Sunday where he shows up and he walks through those doors. And all I can imagine is like, God, will our hearts be ready to not make him crawl through the roof? Will our hearts be ready to receive Billy? Will our hearts be ready to open our lives with shameless friendship and belonging that costs us something? so that Billy can get to Jesus and he can lay down his mat. He can walk out of here and and he can have some friends, some connections for the journey. Man, I live for Billy. And God's calling him home. I am confident of that. You don't ask that question unless God's calling you home. Will we become the type of people who are open to Billy? Who does our church exist for? Our self-righteousness or the forgiveness of the sin and the healing of the human heart of every person that God is putting in our lives? And here's my gut instinct, is that some of you came in today highly aware of your own need. Some of you are leaving here broken for Billy, but there's a step in between the two. And that step for some may be that you came in highly aware of the physical thing, of the mental thing, of the relational thing that you want healing from. But God's invitation first is to say, I forgive you. I forgive your sins. I forgive your shame. I forgive the thing that has been the barrier to walking in healing. And so I I want you to close your eyes for a moment. I want the Holy Spirit to be invited. And so we just say, come Holy Spirit. You've been here all along, and so we are raising our awareness to focus on you. And the things that we brought in and the baggage and the hurts, would they become secondary to a focus on you, Jesus? And I want you to ask Jesus a very profound question. Very profound question. Jesus, Will you heal me of my hurt? If all you can think about is your hurt right now. Can I just tell you what I'm imagining? I I imagine each of us walking in today with some degree of like a hole in our soul, just a hole, a gap. And there's so many things we've been striving to do to cover that gap for ourselves. But Jesus is the one that the only one that can actually cover that goal, that gap. And so come some of you are coming in with a hole in your soul, but you may be leaving today with a soul that is more whole. You came in with a hole in your soul and you may be leaving today with a soul that is more whole. I can imagine a roller coaster for some reason again. Roller coaster is like tipsy turvy ups and downs, fast, slow. It's the bane of my existence. Um, And that's what your life has been. But the invitation of God today may be just stay on the roller coaster. Because through your pain, God is going to bring more purpose than you've ever imagined. So what do you need to bring to Jesus? What mat do you need to be honest about? And maybe none of that resonates, but this could be the final invitation. It's who do you need to bring to Jesus? Who's your Billy? Who is your paralyzed man? Who are you contending for, caring for, giving compassion, giving empathy, showing for, loving, including, even when there's nothing in return?
And so this is the invitation. Jesus, would you break our hearts for what breaks yours? And would you begin in us a work of healing, of renewal, of love, and away from fear, away from hurt. For some, this may be a day of immense breakthrough. And for others, this is another small step on the journey towards healing. But whatever it is, your power is the same. And so Jesus, we invite you to make yourself known to this room of people. Make our hurts known. May we be honest. May we confess to you what needs confessed. May we, maybe there's confession to one to another that needs to happen in the room. But Jesus, would you help us to leave here, leaving behind the mats that we walked in with?